1 Corinthians chapter 6 is where we're going to be. So if you've got a Bible, if you would open that up. If you've also got that app, uh, there's a few other scriptures that you will see on the Uversion app thing. And so you can get, go ahead and get there. But we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, kind of tackling the first 11 verses in that. Uh, most of you probably already know this. I love to make sure just to reiterate, just in case people don't know, uh, to my students whenever we're talking. And so just so everybody knows, the book that we're reading, it's a letter that Paul wrote. He wrote to a church in Corinth that he established in Acts chapter 18 when he was on his missionary journey. These letters, they are books of our Bible. They weren't just something that when the church got them, they were filed away in a cabinet or something. These letters, when they were written to these churches, they were publicly posted out for anybody to come and see. If you know anything about Corinth is a big place. This is an important letter. And you know, obviously, going through six books already, there are a few things that need to be addressed that Paul has got to take care of. So just establishing that, just establishing the fact that it's a letter, a lot of people are going. If you look at your heading on, ver on chapter 6, right at the top, uh, I think that the heading speaks a lot. And when I looked at this a couple weeks ago, I thought, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. Because the heading uh, for mine, I'm going to be reading out of the NLT uh, tonight and a little bit of NIV as well. But regardless of what translation you're looking at, I'm sure that your heading is very similar to something like this. Uh, avoiding lawsuits or lawsuits among believers or lawsuits with believers or against believers or whatever it is. And automatically when I read the heading, before even reading the scripture, it feels like we're getting ready to read something out of a front page newspaper article. Uh, a lawsuit is happening. We see this stuff, unfortunately, too many times. We know that there's a lot of things that happen with churches, with Christian organizations, with whatever it is where lawsuits are filed against them, where they're filing lawsuits against them, and automatically we think, this is going to be a mess. This is going to be a little messy. You can just go on Google and type the word church and lawsuit, and you are going to see a lot of stuff. One of those that caught my eye was this. It said, a church had to sue the person who ran bingo at their church. And I was like, oh, sweet. It's apparently like a major, major scandal in this church. But there are terrible things going on. And we are familiar with this idea of lawsuits. We're familiar with this idea of going to court and taking somebody to court. It's been a, a comeback that probably some of you have used before. Fine, just sue me. Whatever. Just sue me. It's something that we hear people say flippantly. I'll see you in court. I will see you there. I'm taking you to court. I'm going to take you for all that you have, whatever it is. Unfortunately... In our culture, there's a lot of lawsuits that happen that really shouldn't happen. There's a lot of silly things that I can't believe that people even think that it's okay. And I can't believe that there's people, lawyers, who would actually try to do some of those things. USA Today put out a list. They put out a list every year, and it's the 10 silliest lawsuits that happen every year. Uh, and just so you know, just a couple of those, just like tell you two or three of them, because I thought they're ridiculous. This is just shows the culture that we live in. Uh, obviously, you remember years ago, this McDonald's controversy, somebody got their coffee spilled on them. It's terrible. So Starbucks, if you look at the top two, we just got a new Starbucks in Rolla. Rolla's growing, man. We got Chick-fil-A now here on campus. We got Starbucks. Starbucks is the, the, the front of the top two lawsuits that happened last year. The very first one is there was a ton of people, not just one or two, a lot of people who filed lawsuits against Starbucks because when they would get their lattes, there was a quarter inch of evaporated steamed milk inside of their latte instead of coffee. And apparently there was major outrage because they were spending like $7 on a coffee. So they went and filed a lawsuit against Starbucks. There's another lady from Chicago. Uh, and this one I think is probably the most ridiculous on the list. She's decided to sue Starbucks and this went into the courts and luckily she didn't win anything. She decided to sue Starbucks because they put too much ice in her drink. She was paying for a premium item. They were filling that cup way too full with ice and she wasn't getting enough of the stuff. She was suing because she was ordering an iced coffee and they put too much ice in it. Uh, and it's ridiculous. These are silly, but it's ridiculous that people would go to court that people would actually think that they have a chance to do something with this, and we have a problem in our culture because we want to go after people. We want to get stuff. We want to do whatever we can when we're wrong to feel like we can have justice. Chapstick was another one on the list. If there's too much chapstick left in the bottom of the tube, whatever. These people are crazy. So let's read. Let's find out. Are the people in Corinth, are they as crazy as some of these people are? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. We're going to read the entire thing. Then we will go back through and break this down in a couple different sections and talk about a few things. So if you would follow along in your Bible that you have, this is what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 11. When one of you has a dispute with another believer, 
How dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why would you go out to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I am saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. Verse 9, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So obviously last week you guys tackled chapter 5. Chapter 5 and chapter 6, they really go hand in hand together. Paul is addressing a few of the same issues. He's addressing the, the big idea of sin, which we saw prevalent towards the end of that. He's also uh, dealing with discipline. He's also dealing with injustice and the legal systems within, within the church and how we as believers and how the Corinth people should follow those things. Unfortunately, we have a lot of churches that, that have a lot of these issues that are, they're dealing with because our churches and our campus ministries and every single place on this earth, we're full of people who are not perfect uh, and we're full of people who, who mess up and we're full of people who, who get in arguments and who do things. Uh, and so there is a lot of issue and a lot of discipline that needs to be talked about. Matthew chapter 18, you know, Jesus sets forward this example for us of how that should happen inside of this. And so Paul, he is addressing the judicial, judicial system. He is addressing how that should work inside the church, specifically in the beginning of chapter 6. And as we talk tonight, as we break down all of this text, there's kind of just a, a main point, kind of a theme that we're going to roll with tonight, and th this is this. It's inside your app. This is the, the simple theme for all of what we're talking about tonight is this. The world needs us to stop focusing on us. So the main theme, the world needs us to stop focusing on us. And we'll tear that apart and we'll break that down and understand that a little bit more later. Verses 1 through 4. I want to read them again, and then we're going to talk more in detail about verses 1 through 4 specifically. When anyone has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why go outside or why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? Uh, so Paul is going to bring some pretty strong words here. And this is why I chose this translation. This is why I chose to read from the NLT because I think that the words that are translated here really help convey in a simple way. I'm a simple kind of guy, and so they convey really simply for me what Paul is feeling and what Paul really thinks about this. But before we get into Paul's feelings, we need to understand what was the court system like in this time? What was the court system like in Corinth? Because he's going to talk a lot about going to, to judges and going to non-believers. So what was it like? It's a little bit different than our system that we have today. Uh, if you think about our court system now, uh, when people go and file a lawsuit, one of two things is going to happen. It can either be super private. Like, you can literally go in a room. There are very few cases that ever actually make it into the courtroom. I was on jury duty. I got called in like 10 different times, and I never even went inside the courtroom because every single case was settled behind closed doors. Uh, and so if you have to go to court for some reason, you can either make it as private as you want, and nobody has to know about it unless they like to go on CaseNet, and they like to scour through and read up on the town gossip. But 
If you want to as well, in our culture today, some of these things become public super fast with media and with, with the internet and all that stuff. In this culture in Corinth, uh, their court system was really simple. When you had to go to court, you went into the middle of town, and that's where the judges are. And when you had a dispute and when you decided to go there, you went out in front of everybody. You were there. Anybody that wanted to could walk by at any time and see you, listen to your dispute. It was a mess. It was so public. When people had to go to court, when people had issues, it was a very, very, very public thing. And I think that that's why Paul is so strongly against it because it's done in public and because there's so much to see. And he wants to warn this church to stay away from the bickering, to stay away from the disagreements, especially in public if you can. He said, man, if you have to, if you absolutely have to have legal intervention, please go to the church first. Once again, the words that he speaks in verse 1, man, you can just tell. Paul is disgusted. You can tell that Paul is super frustrated. He says, "How, when, when someone has a, a dispute, how dare you file a lawsuit? How dare you do these things? This is Paul bringing some heat to these people, trying to get them to understand how he feels about this and how strongly he thinks about this. He goes on a little bit later in verses 2 and 3, and he starts to talk about how one day you'll judge the angels and you'll judge the world. And Paul is just making a really simple point behind some of these things, a really simple point to say, look, some of these things that you are so worked up about right now, some of these things that you are wanting to go to court, you're wanting to get revenge about, they're small, and they'll, they're trivial things in light of a final judgment day one day that's going to happen. Verse 4 Paul kind of brings it back a little bit, and he says, man, if you do have legal disputes, then why go outside, bring it into the church? Uh, and I think this is a really interesting verse because a lot of people, I know a lot of Christian people who believe that Christians shouldn't go to court. Is Paul saying that you absolutely cannot file a lawsuit against somebody? Uh, it sounds like what Paul is saying is really, he said literally, if you have to do this, please take it to the church. Please take it to the church and try to resolve the issue before you have to go to this outside court, before you have to go to non-believers. I'll tell you guys today, in our, in our county alone here at Phelps County, a couple of our judges, they are really good Christian people that love the Lord and do a lot of stuff. The system was different then than it is now. And I don't believe, and if you have anything that you'd like to ask me about later, I'd love to talk to you. I don't believe that Paul's saying and saying forever that no Christian should ever file a lawsuit because unfortunately, we live in a world where a lot of crazy things happen. We live in a world where a lot of, of broken people live. And I'm not saying that we go try to sue Starbucks or McDonald's, but I'm saying uh, that I know that for some people, there's large medical issues that happen. I know for some people there's issues of abuse that happen. And I know for some people, man, the courts can actually be a good thing. And so in verse 4 when he says it, he says, if you have to do it, if you have legal, please, why would you go outside? People are not respected by the church. Why would you not do it in the church? Matthew 18, the example that Nathaniel started to talk about last week a little bit when Jesus says, this is how you handle discipline inside the church. And once again, there's always going to be discipline inside of every church that you go to, every small group you're part of, whatever. There's always going to be bickering because we're not perfect people and we are sinful people and we like to get in arguments with other people. And, and so Paul is bringing some really important words in here and saying, please try. Please go to the church before you do anything else. The Matthew. The example that Matthew talks about when Jesus is saying those words and he records a man, go and confront that person, just you. If that doesn't work, then grab somebody else, another believer, and take them with you and go and try to talk to them. And if that doesn't work, maybe you do have to go to the church and maybe you do need to go to the church and they need to help you facilitate this thing. Most of these disagreements that were going on with these lawsuits, man, they had to do with money. They had to do with land. Probably some things that a lot of our lawsuits and stuff have to deal with today. I think that Paul is really getting at through some of this, through these first four verses, is this. That we need to check our attitude on some of these things. That we need to figure out what, what is our motive behind having to solve a dispute with somebody in this, in this manner. Uh, obviously, before we go and do anything, we should humbly 
try to solve these issues ourselves. We should humbly be focused on God. We should be focused on trying to solve this issue amongst another believer because, man, we're going to find out pretty soon that it can be really dangerous. And Paul said, man, please do not go and do this in front of non-believers. We can find out what's going to happen. But, but a lot of people were focused on, man, I want revenge. I, I want to get what's coming to me. Somebody has done me wrong, and I want to see them pay the price for what they did. Maybe our motive needs to change a little bit. The idea here is that we need to drop some of the desire for revenge. We need to drop some of the anger, and we need to seek resolution. And so regardless of whether this is in a church setting, maybe this is just you and another person that's here or another believer, and you've had a disagreement with them. You've been bickering with them. You've been having some issues. You don't like what they're doing. They're doing something that you think is wrong. Whatever it is, I would say, number one, we got to check what our motive is. What is our attitude behind it? we got to humbly go to that, and we need to follow the example that Jesus set And hopefully, just because you have a small dispute with somebody, you're not going to go out to a court. But what happens is that you go to a lot of our friends, and we gossip about it, and we go to other people, and we air our dirty laundry out on social media. Uh, And man, that, that that can be dangerous. That can cause some problems. Another thing that Paul is saying is this. Uh, that, that we shouldn't be uh, in the business of, of trying to show hatred to people. We shouldn't be trying to shame people. We shouldn't be demanding the removal of their rights and seeking revenge. Uh, instead, maybe we should listen to the words that Jesus said. And in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, probably some familiar words that you've heard. Jesus talking about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 39, he says this, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, then hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sent rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And I think the reason I read both of those sections is because I think that they go hand in hand. Jesus says, man, we, we, should, we, should willingly, we should willingly give if somebody's trying to sue us. It shouldn't be all about us going and, and trying to desire revenge and try to desire to take them down. We should give, and then I, I read those words that are right after it, words that a lot of us know and a lot of us have heard many times before. Uh, man, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you've ever been in an argument with somebody, if you've ever been in a, di- a disagreement with somebody, or maybe it's your church that has let you down in some way or there's some type of disagreement going on with a small group or whatever it is, you've been there, you understand those feelings, and there's these feelings sometimes of anger. There's these feelings sometimes of us having hatred and whatever it is, and we read these words of Jesus right after he tells us to just, just willingly, willingly give, to do this, to just, just do it, whatever we can. Don't hold on to these things. And we see him say, man, love your enemies, and pray for those people who persecute you. Why? Why would Jesus have to say something like that, something that's hard, something that's tough for us to do? And I think it's this, uh, because Jesus knew that when we hated people and, and we prayed for them and we tried to love them, that it would change our hearts. Uh, because when we're praying for somebody and we're trying to love them, then hate can't exist in that. Uh, it changes our, our motives. It changes our desire. It replaces anger with love. We have to listen to some of those words that Jesus said. Paul, in verse 5, our next section is 5 through 8, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the next few verses to reread again. Verse 5, I'm saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. Man, these are some, these are some more tough words that Paul is saying. Have you ever said something to somebody, and, and before you said it, you said, hey, I, I don't mean this to come across the way it is, or I don't mean to offend you, but I need to tell you this. Paul is saying, hey, I am saying this to shame you. 
He is straight up telling them what I'm telling you. The reason I'm telling you is because I am going to shame you in saying this. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough, who is able to solve this dispute? The funny thing about this is that Paul is taking a stab right back at the church. Because in chapter 4, verse 10, he's talking about how the church brags that they're full of all these wise people. And the church has so much wisdom in it. And Paul comes out and he really brings it back to him. Isn't there anybody wise enough among you to solve even these small, silly disputes, but instead you have to go and you have to sue somebody in front of non-believers, in, in a court system that's corrupt, in front of these judges that who knows what their value system is, who knows what their religion is. Paul is bringing it to them and getting onto them. And in verses 6 through 8, Paul is arguing something that's not very popular. He's arguing the simple idea that, man, maybe we need to sacrifice our own right. We need to sacrifice our own freedom for the good of the church. Maybe we need to stop thinking so much about how we've been harmed, and we need to stop thinking about the revenge that we want, and maybe we need to start thinking about the good of the church, a view that is not very popular in our culture. It's kind of counterculture to what's going on because when we are wronged, we want somebody to pay for wronging us. We want somebody to understand, and we want somebody to know exactly what they did. And we like to look out for number one, which is us. And I think that we have a problem. And I think that the main point tonight is that the world needs us to stop focusing so much on us, and we need to start focusing more on the kingdom than on getting revenge from people. We need to start focusing more on the kingdom than trying to go and get money because somebody did something wrong to us. He says, man, were you cheated? That's fine. You know, he's re saying these things. Why not just let yourself be cheated? It's not all about us. Paul's desire is for these people to sacrifice their desire and try to not blemish the church. It's not all about us. I think that we could learn a lot from the words that Jesus spoke in Luke 9. And these are words that we know. And these are words that we hear. And these are words that we think they sound good, but they're really hard for us to do it. Luke 9, Jesus said this, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Deny ourselves. It's not about us. We need to deny some of our desire. We need to deny our want to go out and seek revenge. We need to deny some of these things. Jesus set a pretty big example for us. And as followers of Jesus, our, our goal should be to, to, to follow after the example that he set and to live that way. What happened is a lot of these disputes that would go out public in the city of Corinth, in the streets of Corinth, People saw church people out there going at it and arguing with each other. Man, think about our world for a second. Doesn't our world see enough of the church fighting? You know, our, our world sees enough of, of people in the church arguing. And our world sees enough of, of people having to go and sue a church or a church having to sue somebody. Man, people already think that the church is, is full of hypocrites. I mean, so many people, that's one of the things. I, I don't like to go to church because the people that are there. You know, man, I, I love the verse where it said, man, Jesus, you know, it's not the healthy people who need a doctor. It's the sick people. Church is always going to be messy because church is full of sinful people. And there's always going to be disputes. And there's always going to be these issues. Uh, and our world sees some of these things. And I think it's going to be so important for us to understand this. We got to be careful. And I think that's why Paul really used these strong words because he tried to tell them, man, be careful. You're out in public. You're doing these things. People are seeing what you're doing, and what you're doing is putting a black mark on, on the church, and it's also putting a black mark on God because people are seeing that, and it's affecting the way that they want to do things and what they think about it. Are there times that lawsuits are necessary? Man, I, I really do think that there are times. But I think that we got to be really careful. I think that we really got to check our motives. And for a lot of us, we're probably, hopefully, you'll never have to file a lawsuit against somebody in your entire life. But it's not just about that. Because there's a lot of times that we argue with, with each other. And then we go and we talk to other people about it. And we put it on Facebook and we get in these arguments. And just think, I mean, man, just think if you're on Facebook and you just go through and you look at some of these 
issues going on in our world. Christian people arguing, non-Christian people arguing, and people slandering one another. Man, there's enough negativity against the church right now. And we need to do whatever we can to not bring that. We should strive to prevent that. It's not all about us. We need to stop thinking about that. Instead, maybe we need to start thinking more about the kingdom. And if I do this, how is this going to affect people's view of God? If I, if I say these things and I air this laundry out to people, how is it going to affect how people are going to think about my church? How is it going to affect how people are ultimately going to think about the creator of the universe? Man, we are super good at, at, at getting in these arguments. We need to remember some of these things that Jesus has said. One of my favorite verses is a section of Scripture from Philippians chapter 2. Uh, and I think that this is something that, that would do a lot, of us, a lot of us good to remember these words, to memorize these, these words. Uh, it comes from Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. This is what our attitude should be. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Pretty counterculture to what's going on. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests, interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every single name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I would say that there's some, a, a pretty great example for us to follow of what Jesus was doing and how we should act. And so just a simple challenge, a simple thought to think about is the way that I act, is the things that I get worked up about, does it line up that it's more focused about me? Or does it line up more with that my attitude should be the same as Jesus? Who didn't come to be served, but he came to serve I love those verses. I love the words that are there that Paul, as well, wrote for us to remember. We should pay attention. Our last section of Scripture is verses 9 through 11. Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And we're going to stop right there for a minute, because I want to save that last verse for a little bit later, because I think it's going to bring a lot of this stuff home for us. This is an interesting part of the passage. It almost feels like there's two different sections here, talking about lawsuits, and talking about these things, and talking about all of these sins. Why? Why are they together? Why are they in there? Let's think about it for a minute. He reminds all of these people about the sins that are going on in the church. And he's getting ready to say for a lot of them it's the sins that used to go on, the things they used to deal with. Uh, but I think he's also reminding them about some of the sins that unbelievers are dealing with. Some of the sins that these people that they're going out and having these disputes in front of, these are the things they do. Some of these judges that they're going to to solve their problems. These are some of the things that they do. And, and Paul said some really strong words that, that these people will never, in, or none, of, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. It's interesting. There's a really big connection with all of those sins as well. There's some big sins in there. Those are some, some strong things. Those aren't just like, hey, I, I, one time I messed up. These are like a lot of sins that are, man, this is like people who are constantly sinning, walking away from Jesus and being deeply involved in some of these things. He's, these are some things that they have in common. They're self-serving, they're all self-indulgent, and they're all self-destructive. Because it's our desire to do these things. Because when we sin, we have this desire to go and do some of this. We want these things to happen. 
because it'll make us happy for a little while because it'll make us feel good. It goes back to this whole idea. Instead of living in sin, we need to drop our sin. We need to drop the sin. We need to get rid of it because also when we fight, when there's these issues in the church, when believers are fighting together, it puts a black eye on the church. It puts a black eye on God. When we are involved in sin, when we are deeply doing some of these things and we're claiming to be a follower of Jesus, man, I think that also puts a, a, a dark mark on the church as well. Uh, it also puts a dark mark uh, on Jesus as well. Uh, but Paul said some really important words in verse 11. He said, some of you were once like that, but then you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Some of your translations will say you were sanctified and you were justified and all these great words and all these wonderful things that we understand. And Paul said, man, this was the life that you used to live and now you get to have new identity in Jesus and you get to have new identity in Jesus. So stop doing these things. Stop arguing in front of non-believers. Stop going to court. Stop doing this stuff. You conquered some of these things with Jesus you conquered them. Quit going and quit doing silly things. Quit getting stuck in the silly sin. We've got to remember Jesus. We've got to remember the, the role that God has played in this for all of us. Uh, the people, they were called, hey, remember it. Remember what God has done for you. Remember what Jesus has done for you. Those words, I mean, I just circled a few of them. Cleansed. Holy, you were made holy, you were made right with God, you're sanctified, justified, whatever it is, however it's easy for you to understand those concepts, we need to understand that, that Jesus made us clean, that Jesus cleansed us by doing some of these things, and those are important things for us to understand because they should change the way that we live, the way that we act, because we don't have to be defined by these things anymore, because we're not involved in these things anymore anymore. Man, Jesus said, deny yourself, and we need to remember that. We need to deny our desire for revenge, and we instead need to replace it with forgiveness. We need to, to, to deny our desire to hate others, and we need to change that, and we need to figure out a way that we can love people so that we can draw people to God and to Jesus. And ultimately, we need to forgive people for silly things they've done or even big things that they've done because God has forgiven us for some crazy big things that we have done. And for the rest of our life, some things that we're going to do, Jesus paid the price on the cross for us. Uh, and if you don't know much uh, about Jesus and you don't have a relationship with him, I just, just challenge you, man, talk to one of the staff that's here. If you're in a small group or a jail group or something and you're like, hey, I, I trust my jail group leader, man, talk to them. It don't matter who it is. Talk to somebody. If you don't know this, if you're not sure about some of this stuff, Man, we love to talk. I'm sure that these people would love and do anything they can to take time to talk about this. We need to strive for holiness. There's always going to be things that happen in our world. Uh, and guys, when these things happen, when these arguments and stuff happen, we've, we know a church really well. Uh, they got involved in a, a scandal, and there was a lot of things that happened, and there was a lot of these types of things, lawsuits, and the church is suing people, and people are suing the church. And it destroyed that church. It destroyed a lot of people inside that church that I knew. People that don't even have a faith in Jesus anymore because of some of those things. We've got to be careful with what we're doing. We've got to understand that it's not just about us. It's not just about us seeking revenge. It's about the kingdom. And is what we're doing, is it going to help people come to Jesus? Or is it going to make people not want to have anything to do with God? It's time for us to let go of our anger. It's time for us to let go of our desire for revenge. It's time for us to change the way that we think. A uh, final thought tonight, and then we're going to close with some worship. In the Old Testament, uh, there's a lot of different descriptions of God. I and mean, we see God in a lot of different ways of, of wrath and all kinds of stuff. And one of the descriptions of, of God that's used in the Old Testament is this. This one specifically comes from Jonah, chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, it says that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Maybe that's something that we need to strive for, to be gracious and compassionate, to be slow to anger and abounding in love. Instead of us seeking revenge, instead of us being so focused on ourselves, 
we got to do this. We got to let go of some of that stuff. Gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. God, we love you. Uh, Father, we know that we live in a world that is is just broken. Uh, God, we know that we live in a world that is full of really messy situations and and people that we're just we just don't get along with sometimes. And and God, the 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 world would tell us that it's it's natural for us to to want revenge and to want to hate people and want to to get what's coming for us. God, help us change our thinking. Help us be more focused on 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 acting like you and acting like your son Jesus. Uh, God, and we just we do pray as as we encounter some of these things that we would be able to deal with them with grace, that we would be able to go to people to ask them to help us, people in the church uh, that could help us conquer some of these things and help us deal with some of these issues that are going on. God, help us to uh, help our hearts to be changed. God, help us to be known as people who are compassionate uh, and slow to anger and full of love. And God, may your kingdom grow because of the way that we act. Lord, we love you. And we are just blessed to be able to be challenged by your word. In your name we pray these things.